This is Reading 5, The Waste Makers. So have you ever wondered how, why, and when Americans became rampant consumers? As consumerism has profound environmental and climate footprint, it's worth pausing on this question and its history. In one sense, unchecked consumerism has been going on for a very long time. In my course on literature and the environment, we read a blistering attack of, of consumerism by the English writer Sir John Denham from nearly 400 years ago. And, and he's hardly the first. However, in the U.S., consumerism really ramped up in the 70 years separating us from the Second World War. Um, it's not coincidental that the same period of time is called the great acceleration as humanity's impact on the planet, including uh, and notably in the form of climate change, greatly accelerated during this period. Radical cultural change is, is an interesting phenomenon. Once it's taken place, we often quickly adjust to the new normal, to people born into a changed era, as are, in one way or another, all eras. It generally doesn't seem un it does seem unusual as all um, as it is all that they have ever known. The new normal is simply normal. However, people caught in the middle of profound cultural change have an increasingly you know, interesting vantage point as they can see the changes particularly clearly and sense often react to them strongly. In the 1950s, as consumerism really took off in the U.S., journalist Vance Packard was a particularly keen observer on the change in American culture. Immediately after the decade closed, Packard published a best-selling, scorching indictment of consumerism entitled The Waste Makers. While Packard was not an environmentalist per se, and Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which in many ways inaugurated the modern environmental movement, would not be published until two years after The Waste Makers. <coughs> Excuse me. From the title onward, the book focused on consumerism as a culture defined by the production of waste, which obviously has, you know, it's environmentally disastrous. Although Packard doesn't take up industrial waste, he focuses in on the American cons consumerism was quickly evolving into a waste machine. Although we don't think much about it, <coughs> as the word suggests, consumerism is the process of consuming stuff and eventually discarding what we have consumed as waste. Packard drew attention to the fact that Americans were increasingly being encouraged to both consume more stuff and to discard it more quickly. Born in 1914, Packard matured during America's Great Depression. Hence, normal to him meant consuming something as completely as possible before discarding it. A jacket, for example, might be worn for many years, even though it would become frayed and needed a sort of repairs along the way. However, the new normal of the 1950s consumerism meant that we would keep a jacket for a fraction of that time, discarding it as soon as it went out of fashion, which the industry produced, um, that produced it made sure that it quickly did go out of fashion. If you look carefully, you can see the early roots of fast fashion here. While the garment industry arguably pioneered this model of discarding what is entirely usable but no longer fashionable, what is now called uh, you know, the fashion industry, Packer drew attention to the fact that all sorts of additional industries were jumping on the fashion bandwagon. The automobile was a prime example. The ubiquitous, ubiquitous car that Packard grew up with, Henry Ford's Model T, famously came in just one color. Actually, that's a little bit of a marketing lie, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and it didn't significantly change much over its 20-year production history. In contrast, taking its cue from the fashion industry, in the 1950s, automobile manufacturer Factures were significantly changing cars every two or three years in a successful effort to sell more and more cars and in the process create more and more waste. But is this as bad as it sounds? Aren't the needs of individuals and corporations arguably both served when they provide us with stuff? 
In other words, isn't this all a you win-win know, for people and corporations? The problem is that time and time again, corporations have chosen their needs over those of consumers, often with horrific results. Let's look at an example. Since the 1920s, scientists have known that there was a link between smoking cigarettes and cancer. By the early 1950s, the American public was alerted to the problem through a series of articles entitled Cancer by the Carton, which was published in the Reader's Digest magazine, which was um, an incredibly popular magazine at the time. But in the 1960s, all cigarettes sold in the United States were required to have a prominent label informing consumers that, quote, cigarette smoking causes lung cancer and heart disease. So, knowing that they were selling poisonous substance that was, moreover, addictive, what did the tobacco industry do? Did they, horrified at what they had done, apologize to the public and immediately stop? To the contrary, they doubled down, denied the science, and did everything that they could to continue profiting from extraordinary human suffering for as many decades as possible. Even today, when a successful campaign has significantly reduced cigarette smoking in the United States over the past few decades, even today, half a million people in the U.S. die every year from smoking. Smokers, on average, die 10 years sooner than non-smokers. But wait, <laughs> amazingly, it gets worse. In 1987, 35 years after the articles on cancer by the carton made Americans aware that cigarettes killed, <coughs> the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company launched its Joe Camel advertising campaign for its Camel Cigarettes brand, which featured a hip and friendly cartoon camel named Joe. Four years later, an article in the Journal of the AMA, that's the American Medical, Associate, Medical Association, revealed that this tar cartoon camel had become nearly as recognizable to six-year-old children as Mickey Mouse. One-third of all cigarettes illegally sold to minors by this, at this time were, you guessed it, camels. Astonishing, the tobacco industry got in the business of making consumers out of children as unbelievable as it may sound, the goal was to addict them to a poisonous substance that would take 10 years off of their lives, all in order to keep profits up. Are all corporations, well, as evil as the tobacco industry? No, of course not. Nonetheless, this is an instructive example <coughs> as it reveals that unchecked corporations have been willing to do extraordinary things in the name of profit and to preserve their industry even knowingly killed people by the millions. As the publisher of The Wastemaker notes, it was, quote, an expose of the systematic attempt of business to make us into wasteful, debt-ridden, permanently discontented individuals, and how the rapid growth of disposable consumer culture was degrading the environmental, financial, and spiritual character of the American society. So I'm curious what you make of the waste makers. In particular, what do you think of the various types of planned obsolescence that he outlines? He also weighs in on an issue that I take up <coughs> in discussing the film, The True Cost. Just who is responsible for our obsession with consumer stuff that is wreaking havoc on our planet? Is it consumers or is it the companies that manufacture all this stuff? Incidentally, Packard continued writing books for some time. Like The Wastemakers, his last book, published in 1989, is arguably as timely today as it was then. Its title was The Ultra Rich, How Much is Too Much? So, um, with the class discussion of The Wastemakers, on the, the normal things which I do, that, you know, I've um, not paraphrased or altered these in any way, though I do correct the occasional typo or because of space concerns, often just part of the comment is re reproduced here along with my reply. I will first quote the observation by a student, followed by my thoughts. <coughs> Excuse me. But before jumping in to the student's comments on The Wastemakers, um, let me first quote from a spring 
1955 article entitled Price Competition in 1955 by Victor Lebeau, and this is in the Journal of um, Retailing. Note that Lebeau is an economist and a retail analyst, not a scholar. Hence, he is not critiquing consumerism here, but rather offering advice to corporations on how products need to be marketed. So this is Lebeau, quote, our enormously productive economy depends that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek spiritual satisfaction or ego gratifications in consumption. The measure of social status, of social acceptance, of prestige is now to be found in our consumptive patterns, the very meaning and significance of our lives expressed in consumptive terms. The greater the pressures upon the individual to conform to safe and accepted social standards, the more does he tend to express his aspirations and his individuality in terms of what he wears, drives, eats, his home, his car, his pattern of food serving, his hobbies. These commodities and services must be offered to the consumer with a special urgency. We need things consumed, burned up, worn out, replaced, and discarded at an ever-increasing pace. We need to have people eat, drink, dress, ride, live with more complicated and therefore constantly more expensive consumption. As we examine the concept of consumer loyalty, we need to see that the whole problem of molding the American mind is involved here. It's the end of the quote. In 1955, LeBeau thus provided what is in many ways a mission statement for modern consumerism. Note that there is nothing here about providing superior services or making better products. Instead, the focus is on, quote, molding the American mind with the goal that the very meaning and significance of our, life, of our lives be expressed in consumptive terms. So what is the role of marketer here? It's not to extol the merit of the product on offer, as we might fully expect marketers to do but rather to exert, quote, pressures upon the individual to conform to safe and accepted social standards through the act of consumption. As you might imagine, many students were mortified to see um, marketing unmasked in this way. So here's the first quote. Quoting um, Vance Packard, thus the challenge was to develop a public that would always have an appetite as voracious as, a as its machines. What a sickening line. The American public is being convinced by manufacturing and advertising industries to purchase items in order to ensure that the wheels of production are never still. This is completely backwards to how production and consumption should work, especially if you look at it from an environmental point of, way, point of view. Before mass production, most goods were made uh, on an ad as needed basis. If you needed a dress, you got fabric and made it or went to a clothing maker and put in an order. Now we aren't even sure if we need another dress, but we probably do, right? Because look at all the cute ones that are on the online ads, reading uh, ready to purchase. In what feels very related to last week's minimalism and Walden content, the manufacturing and advertising industries have completely warped our sense of desire for material goods. Yeah, great point. The end game for marketers is now, to quote from this apt comment, to completely warp our sense of desire for material goods, as this person notes. The way that consumption um, worked historically was largely based on need. If you needed a dress, you got fabric and made it or went to a clothing manufacturer and put in an order. However, need is now generally overshadowed by desire. In other words, do we really need that new dress or whatever it is that's on offer? The answer is generally no. But that doesn't mean that we still don't desire it. Where does this desire come from? Well, from marketers, of course. In this sense, the goal of marketers is to generate desire where there is little or no need. However, Victor Leblo, as Victor Leblo suggested, just in case desire is not sufficiently motivating in itself, marketers need to exert pressures on the individual to conform so that Leblo's imagined male consumer will consequently express his aspirations and his individuality in terms of what he wears, drives, 
eats, his home, his car, his patterns of food serving, his hobbies, and so forth. And simple enough, if we just purchased what we needed, marketers would only sell a fraction of what became possible through industrial mass production and the largely unchecked exploitation of workers. Consequently, in addition to manufacturing products, all sorts of companies are now in the business of manufacturing desire. At first hearing, it may sound a little odd, but most corporations, from fashion brands to pet food and automobile manufacturers, are first and foremost in the business of manufacturing the same thing, desire. Without desire, these industries would be decimated if they had to rely on need as a sole motivator. After all, if you just purchased a new shirt when you really needed it, when your old shirt was frayed beyond repair, the fashion industry, and, and that's especially, you know, the, the fast fashion industry, would crumble. And if desire is not a sufficient motivator, desire has a less pleasant counterpart as we human beings are hardwired to conform to the norms of the groups to which we belong. In this case, manufacturers are not just manufacturing um, desire, but engineering social pressure on the individual in order to make them consume. So, for example, by quickly shifting fashion trends, an individual is made to be embarrassed by wearing a shirt from last year and hence will discard it and purchase a new one. As we all know firsthand, social pressure is a powerful thing. Everybody wants to fit in. Nobody wants to be an outcast. <coughs> Marketers are turning this truism of human nature against us. If we consume enough and correctly, the promise is that you will fit in. If you don't, the threat is that you will risk outcast. Regarding whether or not you actually need the product on offer, this is something of a minor concern. So the next comment. But the American economy has been built on the notion that a healthy economy is one that grows due to increased consumption. In order to prolong this unsustained economic growth, the entire advertising industry was created. All this feels so artificial. What makes the waste maker such an uncomfortable read is the fact that, this, that it is so simply explains uh, many of our desires are not our own. They are a product of an economy and a culture that excels in shaping desires and inventing scenarios and, fades and fads that draw, attention, um, to, uh, draw the attention of our wallets. If being mindful of your consumption for the sake of the environment isn't for you, maybe being mindful of uh, the sake of acting on what, actually, on what actually you want is. So that's the end of the quote. This comment nicely dovetails with the previous one, especially regarding the observation that, quote, what may makes the waste maker such an uncomfortable read is the fact that it so simply explains that many of our desires are not our own. This is rightly a disconcerting thought, as we tend to feel that our basic emotion, like desire, originates with us. Hence, it's more than a little disturbing to realize that they are being manufactured elsewhere. If this were being done for the good of the consumer, it might be less worrisome. In other words, if marketers were creating a desire for healthy and inexpensive food, this might be a little more acceptable. However, as Thoreau realized over 150 years ago, corporations largely act in their own interest, not those of the consumer. Hence, soda companies, for example, sell us branded sugar water that is neither healthy nor inexpensive. Indeed, the WHO, and that's of course the, the World Health Organization, is urging global action to curtail consumption, curtail consumption of healthy, um, uh, healthy impacts of sugary, the health and impact of sugary drinks, as these can be a major factor in global increase of people suffering from obesity and diabetes. The problem is that a number of the corporations selling sugar water is so large and profitable that they have been very successful at maintaining their prosperity and wealth, even though they are contributing to global health problem among people consuming their products. You may not be surprised to learn that the five most valuable brands on the planet are, in order, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Samsung. What may be a surprise is that number six is Coca-Cola. 
This comment also draws attention to the fact that our economy is built on the notion of unending growth, which is fueled by consumerism. The difficulty is that we do not have sufficient resources on this planet to sustain and support infinite growth. It just can't happen. Indeed, we have already exceeded what is sustainable for this planet. The solution is simple enough. We need to enter a period of economic degrowth. Degrowth emphasizes the need to reduce global consumption and production and advocates just and ecologically sustainable society with social and environmental well-being replacing GDP, that's gross domestic product, as the indicator of prosperity. So make no mistake, degrowth presents its own formidable set of challenges. However, we have no choice but to find a way to make this work if our species is to live sustainably on this planet. So the next quote. Our mindset towards wanting more is becoming a serious problem. This reminded me of a trip I made to Nicaragua, where I went to volunteer to build a school for a small community. I, and it was there that I learned how consumerism is making my life and others in developed countries worse. The people I was lucky to meet were happy and content with what little that they had. The locals were always smiling and laughing with each other, which took me by surprise. <coughs> because in America, we, we literally have everything these people don't, yet we find ourselves unhappy that we can't get that new iPhone or new clothes. These people in Nicaragua don't have money to buy one pair of shoes, yet they seem happier um, than us who have everything at our fingertips. This was just an eye-opening experience, and hopefully we can change our mindsets um, that are wired to always want more, close quote. So after manufacturing desire, product advertisements often hold out a promise that purchasing their product will, uh, makes sense, satisfy the desire. First, as we have seen, this is worrisome as the desire didn't actually exist before the corporations manufactured it. Second, the promise of fulfilled desire is also problematic. If products don't, you know, fulfill our desires, then people who purchase them uh, the most should be, uh, then people who purchase the most should be the most satisfied, i.e. the happiness. Consequently, it is often applied that people who are outlandishly, you know, gorging themselves with consumption, like some influencers, are the luckiest, happiest human beings. However, even without resorting to statistics here, I think that most of us know from firsthand experience that consumerism does not, deep down, make us happy. Consequently, consumerism, even outrageously supersized consumerism, is not the answer. In dramatic contrast, this comment considers people who are largely untouched by consumerism. As um, we are accustomed to equate happiness, equate consuming things with happiness, it's striking that people who have so little are so happy. For the person who made this observation, this was, this was <coughs> quote, an eye-opening experience, as largely stepping outside of consumer um, culture made it clear that it is not only failing to deliver its promise to fulfill our desires and make us happy, but it is in fact making us even less happy than the people who have very little. This is not to say that all sorts of people across the planet should remain living in poverty and not have a range of needs met successfully. However, there is a danger here as corporations are waiting in the wings to convert these people into consumers. Corporations often speak of low and middle income countries as, quote, emerging markets. Let's stay with our example of Coca-Cola and the sale of sugar water. In low and middle income countries, only a quarter of what people drink is a commercial beverage. <clears throat> in wealthy countries, companies like Coca-Cola have already done an extraordinary job when it comes to manufacturing desire of their product, as 75% of the beverages consumed are commercial products. However, experts agree that for Coca-Cola, the greatest growth opportunities ahead are in emerging markets like India. In order to realize this potential, Coca-Cola needs to manufacture desire in these countries. 
India is considered an emerging market for Coca-Cola. The average yearly income for a laborer in rural India is about 300 rupees per day, and that's for a man. For a woman, it drops to about 200 rupees. The cost of a small 12-ounce Coke is 34 rupees. Hence, if you work a 12-hour day, a man needs to work for more than an hour to buy a small Coke. Or nearly an hour and 45 minutes if you're a woman. In a country where 76 million are without access to safe drinking water, it's wildly misguided to manufacture desire for a water substitute that many people simply cannot afford and no one really needs, especially if it can contribute to a host of health problems. Alternately, corporations um, could step in and supply what people really need, safe drinking water. So the next quote. This week's reading is very interesting in many aspects. It was written in the early 1960s, just as modern consumerism in the United States was taking root. Now, I am from China, and modern consumerism is also taking root here in an extremely rapid pace in recent years. Therefore, this book has an even closer relationship to me. In the 21st century, the book can be a reflection of the past decades for the developed countries, but can still be a warning sign against the potential dangers of consumerism, not to the American people as it was in the 1960s, but to developing countries now. Yeah, what a great comment. As I noted in my little introduction to the Wastemakers, People caught in the middle of profound cultural change have an interesting vantage point as they can see the changes particularly clearly. Vance Packard was well positioned to see the emergence of truly modern American consumerism in the period following the Second World War. World War. However, this is not something that has happened um, in a generation or two, but something that is ago, but is still happening right now. In some places, Consumerism is, in fact, something that has yet to arrive, or it is only now coming on the scene. Indeed, for most people on the planet, large-scale consumerism is perhaps looming in the future. Well, we might often see this type of consumerism is part of the so-called American dream, in addition to cars, music, and a host of other products, uh, the notable thing here is that America is selling, what America is selling the world may well be the American dream itself. And by that I mean our American consumer culture. This is a sobering thought. Not only did the United States directly contribute more to the climate crisis than any other country, we have indirectly encouraged the rest of the world to do the same. <coughs> In short, we are potentially multiplying the human harm that we did to the planet many times over by encouraging the rest of the world to do the same. Of course, other countries also played a role in the development and spread of modern consumerism. However, arguably, no country did it to the extent of the United States, making supersized consumption our signature way of life. Because the world now looks to the United States as a cultural model, um, you know, can we reimagine the American dream to be environmentally sustainable? If so, we need to sell the world this new dream. Can we succeed at this? Honestly, I, I don't know. It may, in fact, be up to other countries to take the lead of imagining a new, better, and more sustainable way of life. So the next quote. There are the soft, inconsistent commercials that youngsters hear daily during their 20-odd hours of television watching. And there are the breakable plastic toys which teach them at an early age that everything in this world is replaceable. And that's the quote. It wasn't until I read this sentence that I realized that I grew up watching commercials that can shape my attitude about consumerism. I can still remember the commercials in which the actor encourages us to purchase their products as soon as possible. Many kids have been impacted by those commercials and their idea about consumption is gradually shaped by them. <clears throat> it's scary to think that people at such a young age have been negatively impacted by the capitalist who wants to maximize their profits and the formation of our values is shaped while we don't even realize it is formed. Yeah. 
At first glance, it may seem that corporations are principally in the business of manufacturing products, like toys for children. However, as we have seen, they're also in the business of manufacturing desire for those products, as well as manufacturing social pressure to buy the product. In other words, even if you are happy with your aging smartphone and don't desire a new one, you may succumb to this artificially created social pressure and buy one anyway, just to fit in. What is in some ways even more disturbing is the corporations are also, in addition to manufacturing desire and social pressure, now manufacturing consumers as well. As this person rightly notes regarding you know, advertisements aimed at children, many kids have been impacted by these commercials and their idea about consumption is gradually shaped by them. Hence, the formation of our values is shaped while we don't even realize it's formed. <coughs> In other words, people are born, consumers are made. Because marketers have a direct channel to children through a range of daily programming aimed at kids, they cannot only sell a child on the idea of buying a particular product. They can, and do, also sell children on the idea of buying itself. You know, consumerism. Hence, to again quote this comment, during the formation of our values as children, marketers are working to make sure that one of our core values is consumerism. What exactly is a human being? On a personal note, from my perspective as a parent, I do all that I can to ensure that my daughter grows up um, to be my ideal, to be a successful human being, which is a happy and, and good person. The idea, from the perspective of our society, the idea is that children will grow up to become good citizens. From the point of view of marketers, they are doing all that they can to raise a generation of consumers. These ideals, I, these ideals need not necessarily be in conflict. For example, one can be a good and happy person as well as a good citizen. Arguably, the goal is to be all three. However, it is unclear why we need to be, in addition to being good people and good citizens, good consumers. To again approach this on a personal note, I have to admit to find it frustrating. Um, yeah, perhaps I should say mortifying, as I daily work as a parent to raise a child in a certain way, which is deeply in conflict with the marketers who daily work to raise her in another way. And the profound difference here is that my goal is to give her an upbringing that benefits her. Marketers, on the other hand, are intent on benefiting themselves at, at her cost. In fact, to once again quote this comment, they don't care at all about her. They just want to, quote, maximize their profits. The following comment will also take up this issue. So this is the next comment. What Ken mentioned about the influence of um, the society on children in particular was quite shocking. On the one hand, the idea of selling to kids was revolutionary. It spawned multi-million billion dollar industries. On the other hand, it can be considered downright evil, spawning generations that only know how to purchase and are subconsciously brainwashed into believing that this is the gateway to true happiness and contentment. This week made me feel as if I've been living as a puppet on a string. End of the quote. Yeah, it's one thing to think about how, in a general way, consumerism impacts children, people, and society as a whole. But it's something else again to think about how this impacted each of us. Personally, and myself included, <coughs> as I was born shortly before the Waste Makers were published, when the project of creating a consumer, a generation of consumers was already well underway. Being hit with the realization that we have been from early childhood on, to again quote this comment, subconsciously brainwashed into believing that this is the gateway to true happiness, contentment, you know, um, that's found through consumerism. You know, it, it really does make us feel like this person said that we've been living like a puppet on a string. I, for one, like to feel that I am in control of my own actions. Consequently, it's more than a little disconcerting to think that someone else is pulling the strings and has been since my childhood. Do I really want to buy that new mobile device 
or um, that invisible and familiar, is it that invisible and familiar tug pulling at me to do so? I'll leave you with that question.